Good evening and welcome to the second event in our 2023 public lecture series, Looking Back, Moving Forward. I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening, the Ngunnawal people. It is upon their ancestral lands that the Australian Academy of Science is built as we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices we, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I am Dr. Jordan Pitt from the University of Adelaide. I'm a proud Birrigubba man from North Queensland. That's where that is. I am one of the conveners of this series, along with the Professor Tom Karma, who you met last event, and Vanessa Sewell, who you will meet later in the series. Thank you all for joining us both here in the Shine Dome and for those joining us online. Tonight we're all about water. We will hear from our speakers about rivers, river systems, groundwater, oceans, marine science, coastal management and more. And how traditional knowledges are playing a vital role in our understanding of all these areas. As we explore the sources of Indigenous knowledges together, we wish to state and affirm our desire to pursue science that is created in partnership with and that directly supports communities, particularly Indigenous communities, of course. It is crucial that this science is collaborative, uplifting and not extractive. This ensures that the science builds trust both with and within communities to provide long lasting benefits to us all. For some historical context, which is about water, um, and a personal story. Um, I was riding a city cat on the Brisbane River to meet with academics at the University of Queensland. As I rode on that river, I reflected about it and how my dad, who grew up in Brisbane in the 60s and 70s, swam in that very river. And how far away a university must have felt uh, and seemed for him, both personally and indeed um, from society as well. We are not so far from that, and indeed in some communities we aren't even there, unfortunately. We cannot right the wrongs of the past, but we can do better now and in the future. That would be work, but we have done it before. Before we get started, if you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, do so by using the hashtag, hashtag Indigenous Knowledges. Questions from the online audience can be submitted by scanning the QR code on screen. Questions from those in the Shine Dome can be asked at the microphone, which we'll pass around at the Q&A session at the end. So now let's hear from our first speaker, Associate Professor Bradley Moggeridge. Bradley is a Murray from the Camilla Roy Nation and is a researcher in Indigenous water science and is in the final stages of his PhD at the University of Canberra. It is submitted, so that's great news. <laughs> he is a board member at the New South Wales EPA and Biodiversity Council, a member of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists, a governor of the WWF Australia, and the president of the Australian Freshwater Science Society. To hear more, please welcome Bradley. Yeah, everyone. Yeah, look, I'm just going to talk about freshwater <clears throat> today and some of our challenges, some of our hopes and dreams, and hopefully you can send me thoughts and prayers. Um, yeah, look, freshwater, without it you die, so it's pretty important. Acknowledge country, we're on Ngunnawal country. I'm a Camilleroy <coughs> man from northwest New South Wales. And there's photos there of people of, of why I do and what I do because, because of them. Um, young generation, next generation, past generations and current generations. So that's, uh, you can see a big chunk of Kimilaroi country. So we, we have 14 rivers. We have the Great Artesian Basin sitting under us. So water is pretty important for, for my mob. And I think that's one of the reasons why I chose water as my, as my career pathway. We'll look at some of the challenges, some of the culture value, values, some, a bit of truth telling. Um, I don't mind if you squirm in your seat, that's good, especially if you're government. 
um, explore some opportunities, and then we'll look at some of the resources and research. So this is, I suppose, our, the ways, our voice in, in, the, in the water science space. So this is, um, some of this is preaching to the converted. You know, we have 1,000 kilometres of blue-green algal bloom. And we have the National Water Initiative and huge reform in the water space. And then, you know, in the last 20 odd years, we had uh, the millennium drought. And then we rolled straight into, we had a bit of rain, and then we rolled straight into the mega drought, which I don't think, I don't think is there a naming convention at the Bureau? Um, for droughts, because we're going to have a lot more of them. It's just like we do for, for cyclones, I suppose. Um, I, I don't want uh, drought Brad to be the first one, that's all. <laughs> um, species extinction, you know, so we've, we had the review of the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act recently, um, and we had a, a climate change extinction. Uh, we've had those coral bleaching events, rivers drying up, uh, millions of dead fish, that's 1.0 in, you know, 2018-19, and we had the native fish recovery strategy pop up. And then, unfortunately, the water issue went off, off the front pages and we rolled straight into those horrendous fires of 2019-20. So um, the National Bushfire Recovery Authority and, and there was an, another couple of the groups. And then, you know, we've just had those horrendous floods in, in, in um, the north coast of New South Wales and, and, you know, we've got extended La Nina and cyclones popping up. So, you know, the, I think Lismore had two... One in 500 year floods in a couple of months. Like, how's, how's that normal? That's not normal. That doesn't happen. You know, I suppose we're in a, we're in a changing space. Maybe the climate's changing, I don't know. <laughs> and then, yeah, we just recently, we just had fish kills 2.0 in the Darling Barker. You know, millions of dead fish floating belly up. You know, there's, there's a bit of conjecture around what caused it. Um, I recently saw an EPA report on water quality and, you know, there was another report recently around black water may have been um, issued in, in parts of the river. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot around water, managing water is, is where we're at. And yeah, there's a, there's a nice photo of some of those belly up fish, which is quite, mostly bony brim, but you can sort of see bigger bodied fish there. Meme time, I always love a good meme. You know, this is day one in the colony. Um, I've probably used it a thousand times, and I'll use it a thousand more. Um, any chance you could show us how to find water, and food, and your culture, and your language. We'll take everything. And then this is today in the colony. How about a we'll compromise? We take everything, and we'll acknowledge you as traditional owners. That's where we are. That's where we are. So where's our water voice? Driest inhabited cotton on earth, one of the oldest surviving cultures on the planet. I believe it's absent due because we don't, well, there's no treaty. We're one of the modern colonised countries that doesn't have a treaty with its first peoples. So we're always being impacted by decisions and we're always excluded. We're always an afterthought or out of scope. It's too much. It's too hard. Oh, that's going to cost too much. So, you know, beyond the welcome to country and the reconciliation action plans, Hearing what we don't have, all those reviews that have happened in water, National Water Commission back in the day, the biennial assessments and our triennial assessments and the Productivity Commission, it's a copy and paste, which is quite sad. And then obviously non-Aboriginal voices telling our story. That's part, partly our challenge as well, to step up. You know, the fish kills, two independent science committees looking at why the fish kills, fish kills 1.0 happened. Not one Aboriginal person was on those panels, not seen as experts, even though the Barker, the Barkenji are named after that river. So that's, that's something where we're at. Uh, always put photos just to have a bit of a word break, just to enjoy Malian, our, our apex predator, wedgetail eagle, and obviously the brolga turning up to our wetlands. And they're, if they're turning up to our water places when water's there at the right time, that's a good thing. And I think we need to be part of that. Some more. We're always, we don't, we, even if we say no, it doesn't mean anything. We don't have veto over many decisions. Decisions are already made or they're overturned or an authority or someone knows better. We're always walking in two worlds. Maybe we'll talk about you know, her, 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 her journey in, in marine science. Um, and you know, sometimes we don't fit. 
We don't fit those worlds. Decolonise water law. I've just made up a new word, aqua colonialism. Do you like that? That's our challenge, is to decolonise water. Another one is a powerful one, is rematriate water. Bring women's stories into the fray. They, they know the water stories. Like in my country, a lot of the groundwater stories are women's stories. So I need to be very careful about where I go and what I say, because the aunties are always watching, always <laughs> listening. So we need to be, you know, we need to bring women back into, the, into, into water. We're always up the back of reports. There might be a good acknowledgement in legislation or reports, but then we don't appear until right up the back. This is my wish list. I'll, 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 it'll be in my list of demands at the end. Oh, sorry, my list. Um, and that National Water Advisory mechanism. There's no constituted... We, we, we have roles here and there. It's a bit fuzzy. There's no national water strategy. We don't have a centre of excellence for Indigenous knowledge in water. So it's something we, we lack. And then government cycles always deleting our programs. I've been victim of that. I've had two dream jobs and those cycles sweep you out and then they, a couple of years later think, oh, that's a good idea, we'll do it again. Um, traditional knowledge of water is not myth and legend, folklore, fable or mumbo jumbo. So it's always put into the realm of fiction, make believe, not real. But our, our, our connection to country and those thousands of years of observation doesn't mean anything in, in modern terms. So I suppose it's how can we build that up and how can we change that? How can we celebrate that knowledge? You know, that's part of my, my journey as well. So what I'm trying to do is acknowledge diversity, how different ab Aboriginal groups are and Torres Strait Islander groups are, how our old people knew water, tell our stories about water our way. Find and refine water in a dry landscape. I think that's pretty cool. You know, we, we, we've survived that. We've even survived policy. Rights and values that protect that water and then culturally validate. I know science, I'm, I'm in the home of science here in Australia, has to go through a process of validation. But why can't my elders validate our knowledge? Why can't that happen? They know their stories, they know their country. That's just something to ponder. So what I'm trying to do is shift the research paradigm from my people, from the researched, and I'm becoming the researcher. I've emptied, emptied that space and chosen that career pathway. So I'm always learning, always learning. Um, and it's about how I relate to my people and my country. This differs, differs a little from Western thinking. You know, it's gained and owned, and you, that's it, yours. I'm hoping to fill that void in water management with Camilleroy Science. So the aim is by Camilleroy, with Camilleroy, for Camilleroy. That's my aim. So it's very selfish. I'm sorry, but it, that's what I'm doing. Here's a, a recent article I did with my two supervisors, Ross Thompson and Peter Adal, you know, looking at it, building an Indigenous research methodology for uh, Camilleroy country. So that, that's, you know, that's what I'm doing. So this is, this is Where's Wally? A couple of weeks ago, I was in the UN at the UN Water Conference, so I was in the big house. I had an Access All Areas card as a delegate, which was quite cool, so I was hanging out with secretary generals and kings and presidents, and there's Brad Mogridge. <laughs> that was, we had an Indigenous session, um, which was cool, um, and myself and Phil Duncan, uh, Dr Phil Duncan, attended that one. Uh, it was quite a challenge, it was quite an eye-opening thing, because Australia in Indigenous world, we don't rate. We weren't picked up. There was a Pacific update. They did seven regional updates. There was a Pacific update and they only spoke to New Zealand because they have a treaty. We don't even get an invite. So there was a direct declaration created for that. So I suppose we, Phil and I, gently bullied, oh, sorry, encouraged our way onto the panel and gave, our, gave an Australian update. So, you know, it was, a, it was, it was quite... It's quite moving, but it was also powerful as well, you know, seeing all these Indigenous people. And now there's a picture of the four Indigenous people that were part of the Australian delegation. Um, so, you know, we, I think that's a, that's a band, band cover photo. I don't know our name of our band, but it's, we're in our power stances there. Uh, got to meet Paddy Mills, a, a basketball international superstar. So he's doing some stuff in water. He was there. Um, and, yeah, I'm still, I've got to look at what they're up to. It's a 
group called Source and they put these panels on roofs that take water out of the atmosphere for drinking water. Uh, there's a famous Brooklyn Bridge. Um, as Ricky and I at the, sitting at the desk listening into other countries give their five minute updates. And then I gave a presentation at, at a UNESCO uh, run session. So yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. That was the first time in 46 years that a, a water conference had happened at the UN. So it was a great to be part of. So these are just, I'll move into some, some things, so knowing groundwater. So we know groundwater, um, you know, dry continent. And I think there's great opportunity for us to, to, to give sometimes where we can with regards to how we manage groundwater. You know, the challenge is like this is in, in the central desert and an old man had painted all these or carved all these water holes. Each had its own name on a spear throw and gifted it to an anthropologist. And then I suppose, you know, that he knew his, the water holes in a dry landscape. You know, that, that's like a modern day GIS layer. Um, I was lucky enough, to, I did a master's in groundwater a number of years ago and um, Professor Angela Arthington asked me if I'd like to publish that in the, in the Royal Society of Queensland's, they did a Springs of the, the Gab and she offered to that, so never give up on that paper. So that was 15 years ago, or oh, it's a bit long now, but um, never give up on that paper. So I, I got it published, which was cool. And then this is, you know, your surface water. Aboriginal people know surface water, you know, on a dry continent. Why do we not celebrate that? I keep asking that question and no one's giving me a good answer. Is it a threat? Is it a challenge? Is it too hard to understand? Is the science too complex for science? Indigenous knowledge. I don't know. Like, I suppose, you know, we were put into the make-believe and the fables and the mumbo-jumbo early on. So how can we move to allowing indigenous knowledge of all these, you know, these water courses that have been digitally made to understand country. Uh, I was lucky enough to co-edit two special issues, uh, published papers linking indigenous values and water management. So one was with the Australian Journal of Environmental Management with um, Professor Sue Jackson. Jackson. That was a, a great honour uh, to co-edit and, uh, to, yeah, to co-edit. So we got an editorial and obviously got a paper in there as a, as a co-editor's prerogative. Um, so there was a, it was Indigenous co-led um, and Indigenous authors from Australia and New Zealand. And there was an abstract written in Ningana language, which is potentially a first for a, um, a journal of, of its type. Uh, I was then, on, there we go, Australasian Journal of Water Resources. Uh, I was offered to co-edit that with Dr. Gail Tipper from New Zealand. And yeah, in that one, we um, produced papers from Australia and New Zealand again, so it was quite powerful. And you know, the, this one was obviously cool because one of the um, one of the papers had River, Matawara River of Life as first author. So that's that's a big big shift in in science journals. And then yeah, Ross and myself, we were lucky to win the G and Alexander Medal for best paper. Um, from Engineers Australia, but because we weren't uh, engineers, we didn't get the medal, we just got a bit of paper. <laughs> That's all right. I know where they live. So diversity, I talked about diversity before as well, you know, like that was, you know, every mob is different. Every, every community is different. And like even within, you know, my mob, Camilleroy mob, there's differences, you know, there's dialects and obviously practice and uh, laws and, and, and challenges, but also landscapes. You know, we're, we're quite diverse in, in, in Australia as a, as a huge island continent that we have all these different landscapes. And I think that's, that needs to be acknowledged. We're not all the same. So this is Water, water History 101. Um, our water and land was given away while my mum's generation, not that long ago, I was just born a human. Um, all the land, the Wallara missions and reserves, they had no rights to anything. So all the land and water was given away, it was modified, polluted. You know, we weren't counted as humans till the late 60s. So as I said, I was just born a human and counted, which was cool. So when we emerged as humans, all the good land and water was gone. So now with the water market and the land market, how water works in this world, if we want water, we've got to go to the market and buy it. So that's, that's our reality. 
Uh, this, is, this is just a paper that was recently done by Lana Hartwig and her co-authors, and it looked at Aboriginal water ownership in New South Wales in the Murray-Darling Basin. You know, you can sort of see some sobering numbers there. So we have, you know, 5.4 per cent of the population, less than 1 per cent land ownership, 55 entitlements across 25 Aboriginal organisations, 0.2 per cent of surface water entitlements, 0.022 of groundwater entitlements. That's 0.11 of the total value of the water market of 16.5 billion that we have. And then the big one, there was a 17 percent decrease in that 0.02 percent in 10 years. So we're going backwards. This was also recently an honour, and, and maybe it was a, it was a co-author on a couple of chapters as well. So I, I was co-author with um, Janice from the Bureau on inland water. You know, so I think it was the first time our national state of the environment report considered Indigenous knowledge and also people and also as co-authors. So we were seen as co-authors, as lead, there was a lead author, which is Terry Janke, as part of the leadership group, and then we had Indigenous co-authors in each chapter. The only ones we didn't have, I think, were Antarctica and air quality. So they were the only two that missed out on Indigenous co-authorship. So, you know, that was, that, that was quite powerful. We didn't see much publicity around that. You know, that's something to celebrate. You know, that's a move in this space. But the real challenge was we lack real baseline cultural data, information on how to research and assess the health of country. Like I always, you know, I worked for the EPA many, many years ago and I thought, you know, they were doing SOEs in, at New South Wales level every five years. And I thought, just imagine Aboriginal people did an SOE, you know, like potentially now we need a 234 year recovery plan to fix it. So how can, how can we do that? You know, we've been part of the, the research, but our, our baseline data is still lacking. This is a photo of the Guaida wetlands where I was last week. Great to be back on country. Um, and we have a project that's called the On Country Classroom. So we get kids from regional towns, bring them on country. They get access to researchers, elders and scientists as well. So, you know, it was good to get, get them out there. So a community from Mungandai, um, right, on the, right on the border, the start of the Barwon and the end of the, the border rivers. So my, my community, or oh, I have family links to that, but you know, they, they turned up in the Guaida wetlands and they were, they were seeing their country be healthy. Like, you know, it looked pretty similar to that. So that was October 2020. So there was a lot of bird, over 10,000 breeding birds had been through the system. And so I suppose now we need some more water then to back it up. Um, and then just, this was 2020, and then December, that water hole, which is one of the deepest, in the uh, largest in the complex, was bone dry. That's my son walking across, quite sad, you know. You can sort of see the, um, you can see the water hyacinth boom, the, the white boom, and that's it on the, on the, the bed of the, the water hole. So that's climate change in action. So two months, it was bone dry. You know, there was no inflows, there was obviously, um, there was no managed water coming into the system because October is, is harvest season, so you can't put new water into the system because it might have third party impacts. So the, there's a real challenge there on managing these landscapes. These are just, I don't know if you know, some water quality resources. I was part of the Joint Steering Committee. Um, uh, there's cultural spiritual values guidelines to include in water quality management. The Federal Environment Department released them in 2018 under the cloak of darkness. Um, it, and we created Indigenous principles, so it was Australia-New Zealand input. And there's my list of demands. Um, water units in each basin, a water council, a centre of excellence, um, Aboriginal people doing their cultural science, a national water strategy with truth-telling, and then maybe a First Peoples water holder just like the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder or the New South Wales or Victorian Water Holders. And there's the growth of the beard. <laughs> there's COVID in between there, so I was in the dark at, on screens. That'll do me. Thank you. I mean, I'm just amazed that you got through all that. That was brilliant. Lightning. Uh, thank you, Brad. Amazing to hear about the work you do. And I think the thing that stood out to me was 
Like you can't just go in and do this indigenous knowledges research, but you really have to go and make space for it as well. And you're kind of doing both of those. Um, so that is a challenge going forward, of course. Um, and we will have the opportunity to pick Brad's brain, which obviously has a, a lot more information than what was in there, um, a little later. But first, to tonight's second speaker, Mibu Fisher. Mibu was an early career marine ethnoecologist within the Sustainable Marine Futures Group at the CSIRO. She is born and raised Kwandamuka scientist, working to strengthen partnerships between First Nation communities and the research sector. Her specific interests are around indigenous science and management practices being considered within modern day fisheries, restoration, coasts and ocean management. To hear more, please welcome Mibu. Thank you, Jordan, um, for the introduction. Um, and I too would also like to extend um, the acknowledgement of country of where we are tonight um, and pay my respects to elders past and present and also acknowledge any indigenous people um, that might be in the room with us this evening um, or watching online. Um, so I'm, I'm Mibu and I am a quantum mover woman um, and I work as a marine scientist or a marine ethnoecologist. I, I just made up that term myself um, because it kind of, to me it felt like it described what I do in a better way than this really big long explanation every time I spoke to someone. Um, so that's how I became a marine ethnoecologist, because I said so. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, this evening um, I'll just be talking to you about my career in marine science and what I do. Um, but like most marine scientists, um, we often have a story about our connections to coasts or oceans growing up and why we wanted to get into marine science and because it's a big part of our life. And that's the same for me. These are a very small number of pictures that I have um, in the marine space. Um, but for me, that affinity with the coasts and oceans was only enhanced by my connection to country. Um, so being a Kondomuka saltwater woman, um, with ties to the Nunaku, Nugi and Grumpu clans. So um, that area actually is off the coast of Brisbane. If you've ever flown into Brisbane over the water, you're looking at Moreton Bay, that's Kondamooka country, including the, the islands that you see there, um, which is you know, maybe biased, but a very beautiful place to, to grow up. Um, and that really um, inspired me to get into marine science. Uh, but I didn't really think I was gonna end up there. Um, but the thing that actually took me from working in aquaculture to working in indigenous knowledge within marine science was when I was standing on um, our family campsite at the back beach with a friend and we were eating shellfish and they asked me what to do with the discarded shells, like what to do. And I said, oh, well, we're standing on a midden, we just throw them on the ground. And they said to me, well, what's a midden? And I kind of was like, oh my gosh, you don't know what a midden is. Um, but I explained to them, you know, it's, it's a place where um, a lot of Aboriginal people discard shellfish or, or other food um, sources. And you can see in the picture here um, on the right, that's what one of the middens looks like on the island around Blue Lake. And on the left is, at least on the eastern coast of, of North Stradbroke and um, Morton Islands, that's one of the species you'll find probably around 90% of that composition of those middens being made up of. So most people call them pippies, I call them yuguris, um, and that is a really essential part of our diet. So as I was explaining this, I said to them, oh, do you know that these middens here, they've been dated back to be 12,000 years old, and they were created by my direct ancestors. And I've been adding to it since I was old enough to eat shellfish. And so when that happened, it kind of allowed me to embrace my indigenous heritage even more within the marine science world and realize I can actually bring that into marine science and try and create a path for us to be able to be seen more in this space. So around oh, 10,000 years ago was the last major sea level rise event. Um, you can see in this image. The, the lighter colour yellow is a rough estimate of where the sea level or where the Australian continental coastline would have been at the time. So this was around 10,000 years ago. We know that Aboriginal people have been in this country for around 65,000 years. So Patrick Nunn and Nicholas Reid 
which is a geologist and a linguist respectively, they went around the coastline of Australia in 2015 and wrote a paper that was published in 2016. And they spoke to 21 Indigenous communities and got stories about sea level rise. Now, these are actual accounts that have been handed down for, so the sea levels stopped moving around 7,000 years ago. So these stories are 7,000 years old and they're all consistent with paleogeology and how that sea level rise events happened. So that's just one example of how Indigenous knowledge has been passed down intergenerationally over time, which is amazing. It's, it's an extraordinary thing to happen because most linguists believe that oral traditions kind of died down around 800 years, but these are 7,000 year old stories that are still accurate and telling accounts of the sea level coming in. Like sometimes, you know, that some of the stories, especially around the north part of Australia, they um, were able to actually witness the sea level coming in quite rapidly within days just because of um, how that landscape is formed up there. So that was pretty amazing um, for that to happen. It has a, a link in with me because I was lucky enough to participate in a, a voyage, a transit voyage on the RV Investigator in 2019. And um, one of the projects on there was habitat mapping of the Wessel Marine Park. And that was led by Geosciences Australia and Rachel Preslowski, who's in the audience this evening, um, along with Marine Parks Australia as well. And at one point in our transit journey, we were able to put a deep tow camera into the water and see a hole. Now, that, that might not mean anything to you, but what was really amazing about this hole was the images we saw within it and how different they were to the habitats surrounding it. There was all these brittle stars in there from memory, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, and it was absolutely amazing. We had permission from the traditional owners to view this area. Um, unfortunately, the traditional owner who was supposed to be on the trip with us um, was unable to make it at the last minute. But what we did when we got to Darwin was myself and an Australian Marine Parks um, staff member went and talked to the traditional owners of this area to show them the footage. And they were very emotional about it because they actually have stories that about this particular hole, which was a billabong back in the day, and it was a sacred site. And so we weren't allowed to know all the information about it because there's different stages of initiation that needed to go through to, to know about these different um, the things that happened in that area. But it just goes to show <laughs> how that knowledge is in part and that we actually do as in, a coastal indigenous people have a connection to sea floors that are way off the coast. So um, I think that's one of the challenges working in marine science and trying to bring in indigenous knowledge and science into that is a lot of people don't recognize the connections that we still have to these places and how they're deeply ingrained within us and within our culture. So that was something that was really fascinating for me. Um, I'm also gonna give you a brief chat also about the State of the Environment Report. So myself and Cass Hunter, we were the indigenous authors on the marine and coastal chapters. And for that, we decided that, you know, we were lucky that we worked for CSIRO. And we were able to um, do something a little bit different to the other chapters and we, it was during COVID, so we decided to do an online survey of traditional owners and ask them from their opinion, from, from what they've seen and what they know about their habitats and their species in that area, how they would assess particular indicators. So we asked them how they would rate crocodiles, whether they thought that was very poor, poor, good, or very good. We also asked them about what context or what spatial scale they were, were thinking of when they answered this question to also help us um, aggregate that information at a later date. Um, and what was really interesting is that there actually were differences in the way our Western academic experts in this field would rate some indicators against what traditional owners were seeing and how they perceived the health of the environment. So there was a really big contrast in a lot of places that um, where the indigenous or traditional owners um, actually scored poorer than the Western scientists. Um, we don't know why, but we can all hazard a guess it's because of that deep cultural connection um, to those places. Skipping, skipping along. Um, it's actually really difficult to 
integrate, well, it's actually not, but it is can be difficult to integrate Indigenous and Western worldviews together. So um, I led a paper in 2020, which was published in 2021, and it consisted of all Indigenous authors from around the world. So in that perspective, we as a group put our ideas around what we thought the differences were between an Indigenous worldview and a Western worldview and found the similarities between them because the similarities is where we can actually make a difference and we're, like, it's, it's a pathway forward at this current time. And so trying to validate Indigenous science and knowledge within a Western system is kind of what we've been doing over this time and it's it's the way that we can slowly move forward and change people's ideas and perceptions on what Indigenous science is. Um, and so that's where, where this came in. This image or this map is um, a picture of the um, authors of the chapter, of, of the publication, sorry. And the green is where all our case studies were from around the world, where people had a direct connection to the marine environment. And you can see it, it's Russia, Greenland, Canada, um, New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan. We all have traditional peoples. We all have connections to oceans and coasts. They all have very deep meanings to us as people. And without us being able to be part of that decision making and management process, um, we're unable to self-determine um, how those resources are managed that we've been managing sustainably for thousands of years. And so that's why it's important for us to include Indigenous science knowledge methodologies within marine science research is because it can be seen as part of the toolbox in being able to answer a number of questions that we have in order for us to sustainably move forward. Um, also, it's, it's very important for us as Indigenous people to feel that we have decision-making power over our country because it means so much to us. It goes deeper than just you know, sustaining us. We have a spiritual connection to that place. And um, if I go back to that image, that's one of the differences between the Indigenous and Western worldviews is that our holistic view of the world really is what's different to Western science. And that's where our strength is in that holistic nature, our connection to life, our reciprocity and the obligations that we feel in caring for country. Um, and that's a really important thing that I think I would like to leave you with um, this evening. And I actually am at the end of my whoops, presentation. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mibu. Fabulous to hear about your work. Um, I think the thing that struck me the most was, of course, that the story's still going. You're still dropping shells in that midden. So, I mean, that's one of the things I, I think is really important about this series is that we're not just looking back, but we're also moving forward. <laughs> okay, now I would like to invite questions from the audience for both of our speakers. You can submit your questions online, for those online people, or we're going to have Murray running around with a microphone. There, she just waved her hand. I think we might start with Paul from an online question. Yeah, very happy to, uh, Jordan. And then stick your hand up, anyone else? Uh, so my name's uh, Paul Richards. I'm Director of Communications and Outreach at the Academy of Science. I'm playing the role of uh, reading out some of the online questions we've been sent in tonight. I uh, have quite a few, um, but the first from Professor uh, David Caroli, who is uh, one of our fellows, uh, he's written in from uh, Bunurong country. And Professor Caroli says, um, and this is a question for Brad, but you both referred to the State of the Environment report uh, as uh, an interesting case study. Professor Caroli asks, was the involvement of Indigenous authors in the State of Environment uh, 2021 report a good start? And what should be done to build on this? Uh, so perhaps first to you, Brad. Oh, there we go. Yep, correct. Um, at the UN, you make an intervention, so I'm going to make an intervention <laughs> yeah, at the, the Academy of Science. Um, the uh, yeah, look, I, I, it was a it was a great start. You know, like it was it was quite an honour to be asked to be a co-author, 
and obviously not as a you know down you're a co-lead author with with, with the, your other authors so uh, it was a fantastic start um, I think some of us got targeted by the Bolt report because some weren't um, actually trained scientists that they were some were still training and some were just knowledge holders so um, you know that sort of aspect was you know you just is that a badge of honor I don't know um, um, or is it a badge of dishonor <laughs> um, but yeah like I think that was a, a, a great start to have that and you know like I think my, my own experience it, it was a challenge because it was just myself as a co-lead author with Janice who had access to the Bureau of Meteorology and you know there's a huge knowledge um, bank at the Bureau and uh, other other agencies that are accessed but I suppose for me it was a, a, a the idea that indigenous knowledge and cultural values and and those sort of aspects aren't being collected by the states you know I, my last slide second last slide I had the ANZAC guidelines um, the Australian marine and freshwater quality guidelines were updated in 2018 and I could find no evidence of anyone using that. No evidence. From a cultural point of view, so the cultural principles but also the guidance to, to include Indigenous people in water quality um, management plans. So, you know, that, that, was, that was a shock. It was quite sad. There were some consulting companies that had used it, but it was commercial in confidence. So that, that was some challenges that, you know, we need, a base, we need to start we're at the point where we're starting from a baseline. Even though we're old culture, old knowledge, long connections, but in, in, in science world, we don't have the baseline data. So I think for the future, you know, in the next five years, for SOE 2026, I hope there's, there's some baseline data that we can start looking at. This is where we're at. This is where we need to get to. It was a it, good start. Yeah, the, well, how much, in your experience then, maybe was uh, the State of Environment Report uh, a good start and how do we build on that? Yeah, I think it was a start. Um, yeah, there was a lot of frustrations felt into the process of um, developing the report. There was a lot of really simple things from probably our perspective that were missing at the, at the very beginning, um, just including things like data sharing agreements and getting contracts signed on time. Um, you know, how would we integrate Indigenous cultural and intellectual property into that? Yes, we had Terry Jenke on there, which was a really big plus for us, but um, we all had individual chapters and they, they were ran very differently, um, but it was a start. I was recently invited to um, talk to a Canadian group, um, so the Mackenzie River Basin Board, um, which is quite a big area in Canada. Um, they wanted to know how we went through that process of including Indigenous science or in Indigenous people within that SOE report. And they were very impressed with what Australia has done because, as Brad said earlier, like it really should be talked about more because what we did was groundbreaking like it hasn't hasn't been done elsewhere so they're looking to us as an example of how to do it but at the same time I said we have a long way to go um, that was just the beginning and there was lots of challenges involved with that and the next report is only going to build off that and be better yeah excellent thank you uh, Mari we had a question I believe here yes thank you That was brilliant, both of you. Um, my question is from Nibu, although I suspect Brad will have some insight into it as well. Um, so I'm not going to name names, but um, quite some time ago, I was told that when we do deep sea marine research, that that's actually not really applicable to Indigenous interests, and there's not a whole lot of reason to go engage or partner with Indigenous communities. So Nibu, I would like your perspective on that. Um, yes. <laughs> this is something that I frequently come up with at work um, in 
in having discussions with our researchers, both internally at CSIRO but also externally, around why people need to engage traditional owners, even if you can't see a connection there, um, because that doesn't mean anything to us. Um, <laughs> there obviously is connections to seafloor, but also the holistic nature and um, like along the east coast, there's migration of species that occur every year that connect all of us together. And this also happens across oceans. And so the impacts that would occur from deep sea mining to something down there actually has flow on impacts. Um, and we don't know all the traditional connections to these spaces or what's in there. And so I don't think we can say that there isn't a connection when um, there is no voice for that connection to be known. Um, yeah, I hope that, yeah. <laughs> no follow-up from Brad? No, that's all good. Uh, we might go to an online question now from Paul. Sure, this one uh, has been sent in uh, by Sue, who's uh, writing in from Ngunnawal country. Sue asked for Brad, could you please talk more about the surface water maintenance you showed? Who produced it and how? Was that that map, the digitised map? She re uh, Sue refers to surface water maintenance. Water maintenance. <laughs> you I could take your pick that? then from your slides. I suppose you that digitised map is um, grasshopper something. It was Robert Zooks is the author, and he digitised um, river basins on every continent, I think. And I found the Australia one, I just thought, yeah, that's magic, because it, it sort of shows... You know, it shows the Murray-Darling Basin, the Lake Eyre Basin, and then you know, it shows you the tropics, and then everything sort of west becomes a dry landscape, you know, arid to semi-arid. And I suppose if you don't know, the, the idea is that, I'm trying to emphasise, that if you don't know where water is, you're not going to survive that long. So the, the, trying to build up to say that if you know where water is and stories are told and retold to, to connection to those water holes, then that's, that's that observation and you know, those water holes will change over time but, and those rivers will flow at certain times of year um, and they'll dry up and you know, like our wetlands are, are exactly that, you know, they're dry, um, dry and wet wetlands. Um, so they're sometimes dry lands and sometimes they're wetlands. So the, the, ch the aspect that I'm trying to emphasise is that we need to celebrate that, that connection and that knowledge to, to, to rivers in general. Um, yeah. I don't know if it talked about, what was it, maintenance? But yeah, I think we'll take another question from Paul and then we'll take, Mario, a question from this audience here. Sure. Uh, so I have one here. Uh, this is from an unnamed uh, person, but they're writing in from Jagara, Jarraway and Gaibal country. Uh, this, is, this is from Mibu. What challenges have you personally experienced as not only an Indigenous individual, but a woman pursuing a career in marine science? How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I had a lot of challenges um, being an identifying Aboriginal woman in marine science. And for a lot of my career, I was the youngest person in the room as well. Um, still an early career scientist. And so uh, sometimes I felt like I was just there because I ticked a box. I ticked a lot of boxes. And so overcoming those thoughts and realising I deserve to be in that room because I went to university and I went through the Western system and I did all the right things that I should in order to be in that room. Um, but also, I'm also lucky because I have my Indigenous heritage there as well, which brings a whole different suite of knowledges into this space. So I kind of have like the secret weapon, I guess, in a, in a way. Um, but it's been really challenging to manage my time. And I think a lot of um, Indigenous people would feel this, that you get pulled in all directions when you work for organisations. Um, you get asked if you want to be part of reconciliation action plans and um, people come to you as the first point of call um, and how to engage and because they feel comfortable with you or you know they've known you for a while and that's okay but it does add to that workload and so I, I think those have been some of the, the biggest challenges in that space for me um, and also just you know being a woman in marine science 
um, being at at sea or in you know in the field is is a challenging thing for a lot of us. Um, there's been a lot of well, there's been a study that's come out recently, and it's just really unfortunate that many of us have stories that are in line with with that, and um, it takes a lot of perseverance and commitment in order to to get through it. Yeah. Excellent. We'll go to this question now in the audience. Working amazing. Two utterly brilliant talks. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to quickly ask, so one of the things that you mentioned was a challenge when approaching the State of the Environment report was this lack of consolidated, like recorded Indigenous knowledge. Um, and you also, there's also the issues of Indigenous intellectual property and maintaining important sacred knowledge that way. What resources or other kinds of support should we be prioritizing to provide indigenous communities to assist with their knowledge um, collection without compromising indigenous intellectual property? So I think one of the, the easiest ways to address that is to actually have an indigenous people leading those reports, um, leading those studies, um, helping people to publish information that they want so their name is attached to it and it's not attached to a non-Indigenous person or an institution. Um, I, I think that's the, the simplest thing that you could do right now, um, and actually partner with communities in developing that research. There's a lot of resources available online and how to do that. Um, yeah, I'm going to let Brad go. <laughs> go. Yeah, just following on from me, yeah, that, that is a good question. I suppose our challenge is, is real. You know, we, we just lived through that experience. Uh, and, you know, it does, it does start early, you know, like indigenising the curriculum, for, for instance. You know, like start early from preschool to kindergarten to primary school to high school and then into university. You know, there's, there are some universities now trying to indigenise the curriculum per se. So, you know, there's, there's that challenge, but, you know, and I suppose that'll give Indigenous students the opportunity to lead in projects that are looking at their own knowledge, you know, like how proud and how cool would that be, you know, that, you know, like my, my son finished year 12 a couple of years ago, um, he has to do Australian studies, has to do Australian studies as part of the HSC, but Indigenous studies, he had to force the school to do it. My daughter is in year, nine, uh, year 10 now. Oh, she was in year nine last year. And she had to go off site to do Aboriginal studies at her high school. So you, there's some, still some real challenges there. And then as we move into university, you know, the curriculum needs to, to change as well. You know? So how do, we, how do we build that in? You know? And I suppose Indigenous researchers are, are going to be a key part of that. But then non-Indigenous people, as our champions, think about when you go, when you have a research question, you know, the, traditionally you, you create a research question, a challenge, you, you set yourself and you go out to answer those, 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 those questions. Flip that on its head to a point where you start those conversations with the communities that, that may have answers to some of your questions, but those communities may have questions that they may need help with. So how can you as a, as a professional or as a researcher work with those communities to build their capacity to understand how to ask questions? You know, that, you know that's probably why I, was a, I chose science. You know, I had a lot of questions um, about water that I wanted to answer. So you know, that, that's been my pathway and trying to answer some of those questions. But you know, flipping that research paradigm on its head to start thinking about Build those, build those relationships, build the trust. It does take time. Um, and yeah, my old favourite is the three Ts. Um, said it before and I'll say it again. Time to build trust over tea. Cups of tea, that is. And then you can add four and five and they're Tim Tams. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's basic. You know, just go to those communities. Sometimes they might just say, look, I've got no time, I've got no capacity. I've got juvenile justice, I've got health issues, I've got just, you know, all the education issues in this community, research may not be high on their priority 
um, and then think about what's in it for them. What are they going to get out of your research or the, the research partnership? You know, do they get capacity in, you know, um, or do they need resources, you know, like um, motion sensor cameras? And then you, you train them up on how to download the data and interpret the, and, and identify the animals, and, you know, just little things like that. So, or you could, um, well, similar to what, like citizen science, you know, they, they could be out there collecting data as well. And then, you, you know, the researcher can help them interpret that data to then build a paper and, you know, they're co-authors, they lead on reports, they're not an acknowledgement they're actually leading in that space. So, you know, to, to get to that point, yeah, we need sort of, and then, you know, like even, I was a contributor to the IPCC report AR6 uh, in the Australian chapter. I think we got 600 words in that big document. And we don't, we, we struggle to identify Indigenous-led research. So that's the other thing is how can agencies and universities and funding bodies fund this type of research so we can reference our own. You know, that's what we want to do. You know, it's, you know, as, as whether we're lead or co-authors, you know, we're part of the research community and we want to be referencing our own, <coughs> our own people, yeah. We'll now go to an online question from Paul. Yeah, terrific. Uh, I've got one here. This is also for Brad, but maybe you reference this in uh, your presentation. It's from Luke, who's writing in from Beer Pie Country. Uh, Luke writes, how can Western science be more accommodating to Indigenous science to allow greater collaboration, or should they remain separate? Oh, I, I suppose my last answer to that question is building those partnerships and relationships and thinking differently as a researcher. But um, sometimes they will clash, you know, knowledge and science evidence will clash. There's no doubt about that. You know, it's not going to be the same. They're two different knowledge systems and sometimes they'll work together. So in the water space, you know, I'm trying to identify places in the landscape that are culturally significant, used to have water and now they don't. Why don't they have water? And then you use Western ways to get water into those landscapes. And then you measure the benefit of what that water does culturally, but also from the ecosystem point of view, but also the, the, the you know, whatever turns up in, in that space. So I think one example could be like, say, fire ecology. You know, that, that's, that's a real, sometimes they do butt up against each other. Right time to burn culturally. We always burnt for thousands of years at this time of year. Fire ecology may not say that, you know, no, no, it's the wrong time. So, but most of the time, the Western way will win. So I think how can we look, build evidence on challenging those, those, those scenarios where we can actually have different methodologies but also work through together where there's benefits for all rather than butting up against each other. So there's... I'm hoping that it, it changes and, you know, science has to evolve. We've evolved. I'm not here in a lap lap and a spear. <laughs> Did you want to comment? Oh, I think Brad covered, covered it pretty well. <laughs> excellent, excellent. We do have one final question from the audience here. Murray? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is for either one or both. How far back do you think we can actually uh, correlate these stories with uh, what science knows about climate change in Australia? I think um, Mebu's example of the Nunn and Reid paper was a good example, but also it's, they're popping up with astronomy, but also volcanism as well, so rivers of fire and and you know they're seven to ten thousand years old. Some of those stories, but um, sea level rise is a big one. Um, you know, you can go back to a point where the sea level started rising and communities had to move and they told stories and they retold stories and that that's, that's part of their culture and their, and their language and their law. So potentially uh, for climate change, like we're, we're seeing climate, you know, I was in the Guaida last week and, you know, there's plant species, they're fruiting now, but they should have been fruiting a while ago. You know, they're, they're fruiting later. Um, you know, in La, La Nina, emus sometimes breed twice in a calendar year uh, because of extended La Nina. So, but that 
sort of changes our connection to a point with the sky dreaming as well, you know, the dinner one, the emu and the sky and the dark matter. So we, we have those challenges, but the old people would have known that we're under a different season when the emus are breeding twice because, you know, they're, they're, that's not normal. And I suppose we, we would, have, would have seen that through this last extended period of La Nina, no doubt. But I think how far we go back, yeah, look, we have lost a lot of knowledge, no doubt. A lot of knowledge has gone to the grave, was taken, um, and, you know, I think we, what we have left, we have will work best with what we've got left um, and celebrate it as well. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just could add to that in, you know, and it probably more goes to the question previously as well, um, around the fact that one of the challenges in trying to incorporate Indigenous ways of thinking within science is that we're always asked to justify or correlate the information against Western science, and um, that's ultimately not what we want to do. We want people to realise that Indigenous science and knowledge is just a different system of gathering and developing and understanding the world, and um, sometimes when you do things in a different way to how you view the world, um, you can create some pretty awesome answers, and um, together, like that, that's the key thing, together is what where we will... Um, be innovative and see all these amazing things come out of it. I don't think, you know, one way is the right way. It's it's trying to get that the understanding that the two are allowed to exist separately. But when they can come together, that's when like the amazing stuff. Magic. Yeah, the magic happens. <laughs> all those things. It's a great note to end on, and thank you for all your questions. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening. A huge thank you to both Bradley and Mibu for joining us tonight. We greatly appreciate you sharing your time and knowledge with us, and great to be in person as well, lovely to meet you. Um, thank you also to my co-conveners, Tom and Vanessa. It is great to work with you on the series, and thank you to the Edge Catering for the refreshments earlier this evening. And finally, thank you for all of us joining tonight, and we hope to see you again for the next instalment of Looking Back, Moving Forward on Tuesday the 13th of June, the topic will be Earth and Land. More information will be available soon. Thank you and good night. <laughs>